In times of despair, one man tirelessly strove toward a more promising future for the Chinese. Long overlooked by scholars, his efforts in the 1905 anti-American boycott gave birth to a short-term legacy that was recognized by President Theodore Roosevelt himself. The movement initiated Chinese nationalism, paving the way for future leader Sun Yat-sen to establish a flourishing modern China. Kong Yue. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, a 10-year ban of all Chinese laborers seeking to enter the United States. Chinese living abroad suffered cruel, racist discrimination from Americans who feared job competition, particularly here, in the railroad building industry. As described by one immigrant, We kept indoors after dark for fear of being shot in the back. Children spit upon us as we passed by and called us rats. Meanwhile in China, the Qing dynasty grew weaker, troubled by political unrest and economic instability. Through military force, foreign nations intimidated China to granting them unequal trading privileges. As a result, China's outdated political system was unable to match that of rapidly modernizing Western nations. Deeply disturbed, Kong Yue made the salvation of China his personal mission. In 1898, Kong presented a systematic reform plan to Emperor Guangxu, later dubbed the Hundred Days Reform. The plan sought to strengthen China's international status, allowing it to more forcefully confront the United States about exclusion matters. In spite of the numerous benefits it would bring to China, the conservative Empress Dowager Cixi claimed these reforms threatened her personal power. She threatened Kong's life, forcing him into exile. Nevertheless, Kong was determined to continue these reforms. To do so, he founded the Chinese Empire Reform Association, or Bao Huanghui, in 1899. Ordinary citizens followed Kong's lead in collecting donations, establishing schools, and distributing pamphlets to arouse popular sentiment on Chinese sufferings under exclusion. By 1905, the Bao Honghui had expanded into over 160 branches across several continents, constituting 70,000 members. And it also was organized around the whole idea of citizenship and, and uh, learning how to operate as a, uh, as a political being and to create a nation where one, in a sense, didn't exist. It became the most significant Chinese political organization of the time. Finally, in 1904, the expiration date of the exclusion policies drew near. Taking matters to his own hands, Kong sent telegrams to his Baohuanghui leaders around the world addressing the new feeling of public anxiety. The telegrams read, I hope you can organize a rally and urge everyone to send telegrams to our government to urge them to fight against the treaty. We may succeed in remedying the situation. That same day, Liang Qichao, Kong's most famous disciple, reported back, I got telegrams from Shanghai and Hong Kong with details nearly the same as the one from President Kong because they also had received a telegram from him. Kong's powerful message was so inspiring that his single telegram sparked a chain reaction of awareness, action, and enthusiasm. Inspired by Kong's leadership, on May 10th, the Shanghai General Chamber of Commerce declared an official nationwide boycott against American goods and services. News of the nonviolent boycott erupted here in Shanghai, Word of the movement carried out through newspapers, plays, and even rallies. Chinese communities participated in the boycott throughout China and countries beyond. Chinese entrepreneurs canceled contracts with American companies and refused to sell American goods. 90% of local Chinese businesses in Shanghai displayed a placard near their shop, showing their support. Chinese living in the United States contributed thousands of dollars to support workers who quit their jobs for the cause. Leading these efforts, Kong toured major cities and gave uplifting speeches. Meanwhile, in the United States, President Theodore Roosevelt was both concerned with American economic losses and sympathetic toward Chinese hardships. Roosevelt condemned exclusion policies, stating that 
We, the American people, cannot expect China to do us justice unless we do China justice. Recognizing this, Kong met with Roosevelt on June 15, 1905, in their first of two meetings. There, the president promised exclusion laws would be modified as to give Chinese equal rights with the Japanese. However, after the second visit on June 24, Kong saw no change and wrote to remind Roosevelt of his pledge. While exclusion laws did not change, Roosevelt did immediately send an executive order to immigration officials demanding that they show the wisest and heartiest courtesy to all Chinese merchants, teachers, students, and travelers. Roosevelt went so far as to threaten authorities that discourtesy would result in immediate dismissal from any federal service. Kong's efforts to contact the president marked a turning point at immigration entry ports. The executive order shortened and simplified the registration process for arriving Chinese. In fact, in 1905, United States immigration officials rejected 29% of appropriate Chinese certificates. In 1906, after the order, this number dropped to 6%. Following one year of demonstrations and letters to government officials, the boycott officially ended. Qing authorities suppressed the movement, worried it would grow out of control and turn against them. While it is true that the boycott failed to end exclusion laws, Kong's boycott succeeded in threatening the American economy. It is estimated that the United States lost 30 to 40 million dollars in trade. This improved the Chinese economy, as people relied more heavily on domestic goods. Furthermore, after seeing the economic power China wielded, other countries began to view China as a world competitor. It gives the U.S. government a sense of rising Chinese nationalism, that this is important. It succeeds in making the U.S. government take China a little bit more seriously. Kong's visionary leadership in the boycott succeeded in changing the political atmosphere and social attitudes of the Chinese people. This provided breeding grounds for citizens to overcome traditional passivity through uniting efforts to amend exclusion laws. The Chinese began identifying themselves as a singular nation working together toward one goal, to achieve equal treatment and entry for all Chinese in the United States. As written by Kong's student, the character of the people is the root of the country's strength and weakness. So it was one of the first movements, and there would be others later too, that drew together uh, the kind of international Chinese diaspora as well as uh, people in, in China itself. Ironically, Kong's major political opponent, Republican Sun Yat-sen, would take advantage of Kong's nationalistic efforts in his own reforms. Although holding opposite political beliefs, Kong and Sun's reform methods were almost identical. Similarly to Kong's Chinese Empire Reform Association, Sun developed the Revive China Society to network, gain support, and lead political uprisings. In 1905, nationalistic sentiments stemming from Kong's leadership in the boycott were spreading throughout China. These attitudes proved to be crucial in aiding Sun in the overthrow of the Qing dynasty in 1912. Essentially, Kong's leadership in the boycott inspired Chinese nationalistic spirit and culminated in the overthrow of 2,000 years in the imperial system. Kong Yue's legacy engendered dramatic changes for his countrymen and a newfound Chinese nationalistic spirit. The legacy Kong fostered through the boycott helped usher China into the 20th century with a new hope to change an outdated system and take an increased role in world affairs. Nationalism, the glue that holds countrymen together, will never be forgotten in China, and neither will the efforts of Kong Yue. But Thank you.